to a new video from Jörg, Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today, again in collaboration with my brother in Christ over there in the United States of America, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. And we are not talking about the Inquisition so much, at least we didn't plan that. Uh, we never know where the Holy Spirit leads us during our studies. But we have come together today for the 12th study of uh, the fulfillment that Jesus Christ did 2,000 years ago, the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. And we're going to prove that by... Scripture. By the Scripture, first and for all, the 1611 Authorized Version King James Bible, and in the New Testament. That means we are reading parts of the New Testament where we can show you that in those chapters, in those verses, it is very easy to see that Jesus Christ was the perfect and full fulfillment of Daniel 70th week 2000 years ago. And he still is today, by the way. We often say, was, he was the Messiah, he was this, he was that. Jesus is very much alive, sitting at the right hand of God in heaven, and he is still all those things. But he came 2,000 years ago, and that's the important message Tom and I want to bring to you. Not that Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago, many of you believe it, on one hand. But when then the futurist agenda hits, all of a sudden, out of one side of your mouth, you say Jesus is the Christ, and on the other, other hand, you say, no, he has, still has to come, because that's the futurist teaching. Yeah? Like, Antichrist comes first, and then comes Christ. That's the futurist agenda. And Tom is going to help us in the study to lighten up and to show you that Jesus Christ is and was the perfect fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. And we are going to study the chapter of Hebrews uh, 10 further on, as we started already. And, uh, yeah, I want to welcome Tom over there, who is uh, deep in the uh, S over there in the United States of America. But that is the snow. Yeah, He is uh, snowed in over there in Iowa. How are you doing, Tom? Oh, I'm doing fine. I'm uh, going to have to shovel my way out of here when this is over, but... Uh, it's nice to be inside where it's nice and warm right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as long as you got the heating working in your house, of course. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Right. Good. Let's go. Start with the study. Last time we ended with verse 16, and we have to continue in verse 17. But because verse 17 of Hebrews 10 is such a wonderful completion of verse 16. I tend to read verse 16 again and read 16 and 17, and then we can discuss this together, if that's all right with you. That's fine. Verse 16 reads, This is the covenant that I will make with them 
after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. You see how these two verses actually belong together, that they are one. And therefore, of course, we know that the Bible was not written in chapters and verses. <laughs> that was uh, that splitting up was done later for, quote-unquote, easier study for us today. But uh, you have to read sometimes these verses together as one. The sentence, this is the covenant, makes sense until you read it up to the letters, uh, up to the words, no more, in verse 17. Tom, this is the covenant that I will make with them. That refers exactly to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, and he confirms the covenant for one week in one week with many, right? Yes, that's that's correct. Uh, he said, I will make a, a, uh, a covenant. He said, with many for one week, for a seven-year period of time. And this is the period of time <clears throat> called the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. One seven-year period of time. And uh, he came to make a covenant with us. And it's a one-sided covenant. Remember, the previous covenants was, if, if you will do this, I will do this. Well... In this case, it's a one-sided covenant. It's all about what Christ is going to do, and uh, which is commensurate with Daniel's prophecy. Daniel says that he would make a covenant with many, that Jesus would make a covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he would cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. So he did that in the midst of the week after three and a half years. And, and that covenant is that he will write his laws in our hearts and minds. And also, he would remember our sins and iniquities no more. Now, isn't that what Daniel prophesied? That he would make an end of sins? That he would make reconciliation for iniquity? That's what he did. And... Uh, He's written his laws on our heart. Now, we should return to his laws. Uh, but uh, somehow or another, the churches, and we've discovered precisely how they've done this, they've confused the whole thing, saying that this covenant is going to be, going to be made uh, by the Antichrist. And that it has to do with a covenant with the Jews. Uh, those that are restored to the land. Mostly unbelievers. Israel, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As a, as a nation, as a people. There are exceptions to this, certainly. There are Jews who have received their, their Jewish Messiah, Jesus, and have had their sins remitted. But the vast majority of Jews still reject the Jesus that they crucified 2,000 years ago. And they desire a sacrifice. They desire to resume animal sacrifices, to pick up that old system that preceded Christ, that pointed to Christ, and that since they didn't receive Christ, they must return to it. They must return to this old system of sacrifices and oblations. Since they did not receive Messiah, the prince, who came and put an end to all sacrifices and oblations, which are not necessary if our sins are forgiven us, if reconciliation with God has been made. So... They've twisted this all around. They've said that this 70th week of Daniel was not fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, but it's going to be fulfilled by the Antichrist 2,000 years distant in the future from the time of Christ. And they call it the, the, 
the se the 70th week of Daniel. Now, there's no way to get around this if if you believe that that Jesus didn't fulfill the 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago, and that this 2,000 year uh, gap has elapsed now. Here we are, 2021, 20 nearly 2021. And there's an Antichrist going to fulfill us. You've literally denied that Jesus came in the flesh because it was Messiah, the prince, who was going to make a covenant with many for one seven-year period of time for, for Daniel's people, the Jews, and Jerusalem. And he was going to cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And he did that by giving up his life on the cross and God confirmed it by ripping the veil of the temple from top to bottom, that curtain that separated the holy from the most holy place, that place where the Ark of the Covenant was supposed to be, where the high priest of Israel, at once a year on the Day of Atonement, would go in with blood and make atonement for the entire nation of Israel. When that curtain was ripped from top to bottom and fell open, and expose the Holy of Holies, we discover that there's no Ark of the Covenant in there. There's no place to sprinkle the blood. And there hadn't been for centuries. So with that veil not intact, with that veil ripped open, there was no purpose any longer for the great high priest. And since the Ark of the Covenant was there, there was no place to sprinkle the blood in the first place. So the Jews had no option but to sew that veil back together and kind of pretend that they still had a reason to make animal sacrifices since they rejected the lamb slain from the foundation of the world whom they crucified outside the city walls on Golgotha. They have our pastors and priesters have taught us that this 70th week of Daniel that Jesus fulfilled perfectly and completely according to Daniel's prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, is yet to be fulfilled in the future. You can't deny Christ in more specific terms than that, that say that the 70th week of Daniel is not yet fulfilled. You put yourself in the same position that the Christ-rejecting Jews are. And you're going to be deceived. And, and sadly, it's the purpose of our pastors and priesters to deceive us. The New Testament, if, if you characterize the New Testament in its basic purpose, it is a historical account of the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. Anyone who knows Daniel's prophecy, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, anyone who knows Daniel's prophecy and reads the New Testament and cannot or will not comprehend that it is the historical record the infallible historical record of the complete and perfect fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy is bound to be deceived. All right? And the purpose of that deception is, number one, to deny that Christ was the fulfillment and to cast it to the end of time and make the Antichrist be the fulfillment. And that has only one object. And that is so that the whole world is prepared to receive a false Messiah. So we have this Antichrist figure. We don't know yet who it's going to be. But we know he's going to sign a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews. A seven-year covenant with the Jews. He's going to confirm a covenant with the Jews for one week, seven-year period of time. And in the midst of that seven-year period, after three and a half years, that's half of seven, 
After three and a half years, he's going to cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Now, common sense dictates if an antichrist is going to cause animal sacrifices to cease, that means there must be a modern nation state of Israel with Jews living in the land. There must be a clamor for a rebuilding of a temple on Temple Mount in Jerusalem with a holy of holies in it. Okay? Ark of the Covenant. All the articles of the temple, a priesthood, the ashes of the red heifer, you've heard it all over and over and over and over again. But these deceivers say that an antichrist is going to make that covenant with the Jews, allow them to begin building their temple, and then begin animal sacrifices all over again. As if Jesus was not the Christ. You see, our job as Christians is to, is to evangelize the Hebrews, the Jews, to receive Jesus, their Messiah, the one who fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago. But this whole futurist idea that they're painting and been teaching us for generations in this country has prepared us to tell a lie. As a matter of fact, the papacy has confirmed this lie. He says there's no need for the Christian world to evangelize the Jews. Why would there be no need when Paul said he would give up his own salvation for the salvation of his Hebrew people, his Jewish people? The Pope doesn't agree with Paul. He says there's no need now to, uh, re to uh, evangelize the Jews. They've got another means of salvation. And that is totally against Scripture. Jesus said, I am the door. I am the way, the truth, the life. There's no one comes to the Father but through me. The papacy says, no, the Jews have another way. That's the whole idea behind dispensationalism, which has been taught in all the churches for the same amount of time futurism has been taught. A different salvation for the Jews than there is for the Gentile Christians. Like God just once again erected the wall between the Jews and the Gentiles that it was torn down at the time of Christ, right? You see how screwed up we are? We're one people. Those who are washed in the blood of the Lamb of God are brethren. But the papacy and the pastors and the priesters of the futurist churches, which is the lion's share of the churches anymore, are teaching dispensationalism, which is absolutely required if they're going to continue making this, this, this claim of a future fulfillment of, of Daniel's 70th week. Because if the Jews are going to return to animal sacrifices again, like that's some hope for them, then there has to be an explanation, and their explanation is dispensationalism. The church is under the dispensation of grace, but the Jews, what about the Jews? Well, they've got to build a temple and begin animal sacrifices again. But wait a minute. Daniel's prophecy said he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. No more sacrifices. Jesus did that 2,000 years ago. And when the Jews, as common sense would dictate, when the Jews had their veil of the temple ripped and but still rejected Jesus, there, held, there was only one thing left to do. They had a priesthood. They had a temple. They had sacrifices. They had to sew the veil of the temple back up and resume animal sacrifices. And I'm certain that's what they did or tried to do against God's will. So God had his people, the people of the prince that shall come, that's, da that's Daniel's people, the people of God, which at that time were the Romans, came and destroyed the city and the sanctuary. And the end came as though it were a flood. Why? There's no need for a temple. 
There's no need for priests. There's no need for lambs and goats and pigeons and doves. There's no need for a sacrifice or an oblation because Jesus performed it. That's how you confirm a covenant, ladies and gentlemen. You perform the covenant. You finish the covenant. That's why Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. And so at that point, anybody who builds a temple and begins animal sacrifices or performs any type of sacrifice, you Roman Catholics and your Eucharist, if you perform any more sacrifice and call it a sacrament or uh, doing this for the remission of sins, you've denied the Lord that bought you. You've spit in his face. You've returned to sacrifices and oblations again. When Daniel told you flatly, he will cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And at this point, the only thing I can say about you is that you have rejected the Lord that bought you. Roman Catholics and Jews who have a temple and a high priest who make sacrifices for reconciliation with God, for remission of sins. What is that but a rejection of Jesus? They still reject Jesus. They reject the door. They reject the way, <clears throat> the truth, and the life. And they say there's another way to the Father than through Jesus. They eat and drink damnation to themselves. Their actions, their sacrifices and oblations are visible proof that they reject the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. And that's how it's viewed on earth, and that's how it's viewed in heaven. It's an open, defiant testimony against Jesus. And that's how it's reckoned in heaven, too. Now, you don't make sacrifices or oblations if you believe that Jesus did that once and for all. And that's the difference between the holy and the profane. Now there's church after church. Matter of fact, the lion's share of the churches in this country believe that God is all behind this modern nation state of Israel and Jews living in the land and the formation of a of of a of a of a, a Hebrew priesthood and the building of a temple and the restoration of the articles of the temple, including the Ark of the Covenant and a veil, and animal sacrifices, and we just need permission from an antichrist to do it. Now listen, folks, somebody's going to offer that seven-year peace treaty, and it doesn't matter who it is, but the Christian world is going to view that person as the antichrist. And you're never going to be able to convince him otherwise. If he signs a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews, allows them to begin animal sacrifices in a rebuilt temple with a priesthood and animals, and the Ark of the Covenant, whatever else they can recreate of that old system. And in the midst of that seven-year peace treaty, he causes those sacrifices and oblations to cease. You won't be able to convince anybody that he's a that he's a facade. You won't be able to convince anybody that he is not the man of sin or the son of perdition or the Antichrist. They've been taught this for generations in this country, that that Antichrist is going to cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease after making a seven-year covenant with the Jews, after three and a half years breaking that covenant. They could, they could make Mickey Mouse do this. And the whole Christian world would believe that he's the Antichrist, that Mickey Mouse is the Antichrist. Maybe they'll hire 
Donald Trump to do it, except he doesn't need the money. I don't know who they could pick anybody off the street. Hey, you want to be the Antichrist? Here's a couple million bucks. Go sign a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews, and then three and a half years later, you break the treaty. Save us a lot of grief, will you? Listen, they could use anybody to do this. And that's all it would take to deceive every futurist Christian in this world, which is the lion's share of the Christians in this world, that that is the man of sin and the son of perdition. Now, at that point, how in the world are you ever going to convince them that the Pope is the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the papacy from the first Pope to the last and every Pope in between has fulfilled the prophetic role of the Antichrist, the little horn, the man of sin, the beast, the son of perdition, you name it, in the Scripture, and he's done it for 2,000 years or nearly so, and has persecuted the saints of the Most High, is drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, has shared their profan their profaned false doctrines and false ministry with the kings of the earth and led the whole world astray. Wars, wars, and rumors of wars, the killing of God's people, global genocide, the threat of a, of a nuclear holocaust in this world. How are you ever going to prove that the Pope's behind all that? When some idiot came along and signed a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews, and then after three and a half years caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. You see, it's going to be like falling off the log. It's going to be so easy to deceive God's people that it isn't even funny. Listen, we've got a job to do before that happens. We've got to tell the truth about the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. And the only most convincing way to prove that the 70th week of Daniel is over is to just read the New Testament. That is the historical record. The divinely inspired, infallible record of the perfect and complete fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. Just take Daniel's prophecy, write it down verbatim. Don't change one jot or one tittle of it. Jot it down on a three-by-five card, put it right beside your computer screen, and then read the New Testament. Everything that is stated in that prophecy, you will find perfectly fulfilled in explicit terms somewhere in the New Testament so much so that it will blow your mind when you finally comprehend what it's telling you. Why will it blow your mind? Because your mind has been blown by futurism. You are so convinced of a future 70th week of Daniel, you can't see with your own eyes the black and white written text of the New Testament. That's how blinded they, they have made you. The lies are so convincing that you can read the New Testament and fail to see the proof, the infallible proof of the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. And the purpose of this getting together with Yerk and studying these New Testament scriptures showing you verse by verse how every tenet of Daniel's prophecy was perfectly and completely fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years, 2, years ago during that seven-year period of time from his baptism through three and a half years later, his crucifixion, through three and a half years, that is to seven years total, the stoning of Stephen. And the, re the final rejection of the gospel of Jesus Christ, redemption in his shed blood to the Sanhedrin, and then the statement, we take the gospel to the Gentiles. Bang! Your 70th week of Daniel is over. 
the 490th year of Daniel's prophecy is complete, perfect, signed, sealed, and delivered. And what have the futurists done? They've simply broken all the seals on that vision and that prophecy and rewriting the history as recorded in the New Testament. They're ready to rewrite it with a phony, false, antichrist fulfillment of it 2,000 years later and deceive all of God's people, even the very elect. And that's just the way it is. And when you see this for yourself, nobody will ever be able to lie to you again about it. The New Testament is so full of the verification of everything written in Daniel's prophecy that no one will ever be able to lie to you again. If you sit down for the purpose of watching carefully as you read, watching carefully for the fulfillment of everything Daniel said in that 70th and final week, you will be irretrievably convinced of its perfect and complete fulfillment in Jesus, as if the sole purpose of the record of the New Testament was to prove the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy by Jesus Christ, Messiah the Prince, 2,000 years ago. And once you're convinced, then you have to ask your question, yourself the question. Now, if the Antichrist is supposed to sign a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews, and that's supposed to happen at the end of time, and that's not the truth, who's the Antichrist then? And when did he come into the world? And then you'll understand what we say makes perfect sense that it was the Caesars who were restraining the rise of the Antichrist. And when they were taken out of the way, the, the power that stood up in the vacuum left by the Caesars can only be the Pope. No one else even comes close. As if to say, God only left us, you know, Everybody would love to go to school and take an exam, a multiple choice exam, except that every question only had one an one potential answer. God only left one potential answer to the question, who is the Antichrist? Likewise, there's only one potential answer to the question, who is the restrainer? Paul plainly said, he who now letteth will let until he's taken out of the way. Who could that be? Can only be the Caesars. They were the only ones in power at the time Paul spoke to the Thessalonians. And once they were taken out of the way, the man of sin was revealed. That son of perdition, the papacy. And since... He rose to power. God's people have suffered like they've never suffered before, even during the time of the Caesars. Look, you have to ask yourself the question. If God prophesies there'd be an Antichrist come that would make himself drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, would deceive the whole world, would rule and reign over the kings of the earth, and would incite war, Wouldn't you think that he would make certain that his people could not be deceived by that man of sin? Why would God send his son to bleed and die on the cross to redeem us from our sins, make reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, and then allow those whom he redeemed with his own precious blood to be deceived by God knows who? Isn't that playing a little bit fast and loose with the, the blood and the lives of the sons and daughters that Christ came to redeem with his own blood? Is God so foolish that he would leave us in doubt about who this deceiver is? You realize that's what they've taught you in the churches. 
that once Jesus came and bled and died for you, God left you in doubt about who the Antichrist is. Do you realize you can go anywhere in the world and ask any Christian who the Antichrist is and you'll get just that many different answers? Why are we so stupid? Maybe you ought to ask your future as pastor. Because all the Christians throughout history before us, up until about 1800 A.D., they weren't questioning who the Antichrist was. They knew, who, they knew who the Antichrist was just as much as they knew who Jesus Christ was. They knew it was the papacy. They preached it all over Europe. That's why Europe is stained with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. And the papacy and the kings of the earth are drunk with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. They proclaimed without doubt who the Antichrist is and how he ruled and reigned over the kings of the earth and how he made vassals of God's people against their will and taught them lies, false doctrines, filthy wine, false doctrines, false teachings, false prophecies from the Roman Catholic Church. Do you realize that this Antichrist, the papacy, is the author of futurism? Why would the Pope author such a thing? To stop people from telling the world that the papacy is the Antichrist. Now we believe that there's a future Antichrist, and we've, with, with saying that, we've exonerated the whole history of the Roman Catholic Church. You can't get more deceived than that. The Bible says, oh, yes, you could deceive even the very elect, and everybody will tell you, well, the very elect says, it says the very elect won't be deceived. Well, they are deceived. That's why everybody believes in futurism. The elect are the ones who teach futurism. Maybe I've gone on about this long enough. Let's see what Yerk has to say. I think, Tom, that you made a very important point and that our study tonight is going in a different direction as we planned, but that's how the Holy Spirit leads. As everybody knows, I'm from Europe. I'm German-born, live in Belgium, and I never was church-raised. And so I had no idea about Christ or Antichrist when I was younger. I only remember, and that's why I try to look at, I have a picture of that, let me just see if I have that, because otherwise I have to look it up in the, uh, on the internet. Now I have it here, of course. I was watching a movie when I was younger that you probably all know. The movie was called The Omen. It came out in the beginning of the 70s, I think, a little bit after The Exorcist, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere around that time. And um, that movie speaks of a child, here, the actor, of course, uh, who is going to be the Antichrist. Six plus six plus oh six, yeah, six, 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 yeah, you know, the number of the name, uh, the number of the beast. And uh, it's the name of a man, and uh, it's the number of a man, as it is said in Revelation chapter 13. No doubt about it. So this movie is in the agenda of teaching you about an Antichrist that rises, in this case, in the movie, out of the political realm. Because I think, if I remember correctly, uh, Gregory Peck was the father, the actor of the, uh, who acted as the father, if I'm not mistaken. I can see the names right here, right now, but I think it is Gregory Peck. Um, and uh, he was uh, in the political realm. I think he was an ambassador or something. And this child, I think the name they give them in the movie was Damien, uh, was uh, the quote-unquote Antichrist. And I think they made three parts of this movie, The Omen. And I know that this, and I'm sorry for my uh, for the language I'm going to use, but this really scared the shit out of me 
when I was young and I wasn't even a Christian, I thought, oh my, I hope I never live to see the time when that Antichrist comes, even though I had no idea what an Antichrist was, because I wasn't religious in any way, shape or form. I didn't believe in God, I didn't believe in Jesus, I didn't believe in an Antichrist, but this movie really got to me, I can tell you. Now the point is, this movie is that really got to me, but you over there in the United States of America, where Tom lives, are much more betrayed through the whole series that we spoke of, as you remember probably in our other reading that we do on Wednesday evenings when we speak about the book from Steve Wahlberg, The End Time Delusions, when we speak about the whole series that was written, that the books came out, the movies that came out of the Left Behind series, yeah? where they also is presented to the world this quote-unquote one Mr. Bad Guy yeah? who comes uh, at the end of time and who will, quote-unquote, fulfill all the prophecies of Antichrist, which the real Antichrist, the papacy, had more than, for the moment, 17, 1800 years to fulfill all them, uh, he will fulfill them in the lifespan of a man of 70 years. That's how betrayed the world is. I mean, the world is going to be as betrayed as I was when I watched this movie, The Omen, and I thought, wow, this really scares the shit out of me. I don't want to live in a world where this Antichrist rises. That must be just horrible. That must be hell on earth. <laughs> yeah? And, I mean, Tom can probably tell you a lot more because he knows probably of these books and uh, the movies of the Left Behind series, of which I only have read the titles here and there. I never watched them. I just watched this movie, The Omen, in the time, and that left an, an impression on me that, Today I'm more than 50 years old and I still remember watching this when I was young. So you can, ex uh, you can imagine what kind of impression that movie left with me. Uh, certainly the very first part. Uh, his day will come, it says. The day of Antichrist will come. <clears throat> and in the meantime, well, in the meantime, the Pope is the Antichrist. But they did not tell us that. That many people who know about the Reformation know about the Reformation, but they have no idea of the Counter Reformation. Uh, counter Reformation, what's that? Many people have no idea of the Council of Trent. Many people have no idea of the real reason the Sociedad de Jesus or Society of Jesus or Jesuits, as they call themselves, or as, as they are called. <coughs> Uh, why they were founded. And they have no idea of the goals of that order. And they have no idea that futurism is a false teaching because the people that I blended in here in the picture, I put it away, just make it again, dispensationalism. When Tom was speaking about dispensationalism, I gave you a picture here of a few people. I mean, this is a nice diagram that we can look at, but that's in German, so I won't use that. I don't have that in English, but when you when we see here these these people, John Nelson Darby, uh, Ryrie, I, I don't know. This is uh, Lacunza who wrote this book of um, uh, yeah, Tom knows. yeah, yeah, no, you know the title. Then we have uh, Irving, uh, we have the Jesuit Ribera, Jeffer, and Schofield. All these people are dispensationalists. These people use the Bible to write the Bible in a way that when you read the Bible, you understand that the papacy is not the Antichrist, but the Antichrist is one single person that comes in the end of time to take the anus away from the Pope of, uh, Pope of Rome being the Antichrist. That's why Tom says they can put even Mickey Mouse on that chair as Antichrist, it doesn't matter. What they cannot do, or will not do, of course, is putting the Pope of Rome there, who is the real Antichrist, no, they will put him when he walks into the temple as another Christ, because that's what he is, according to his own title. Vicarius Fili Dei means the substitute of Jesus Christ here on earth. He will then walk in there and he will be the one that the whole world will adore as Jesus Christ, where he is not Jesus Christ, but he is the Vicarius Fili Satan, yeah? he is the man of sin, he is the son of perdition, he is the man mask after which or behind which Satan himself hides. 
And when you bow down to worship the Pope, you bow down to worship Satan. And that's exactly what he wants when you read Matthew or Luke chapter 4. About the time after Jesus Christ was anointed, was baptized in the river Jordan, he went into the desert for 40 days and he was tempted by the devil. And the devil said, he put him on a high mountain and he said to him, All these I will give to you because it is given to me to who, to, uh, power is given to me to give it to whomever I want, if you bow down and worship me. And that's what it's all about. Worship. But what is worship? Obedience is the highest form of worship. Now think about it. Whom are you going to obey? Are you going to obey your worldly government? Are you going to obey the new power that is coming into form right now under the quote-unquote new world order, one world religion, one world government? Or are you going to obey Jesus Christ? That's the interesting point. But I think I gave Tom now points enough to shoot another for a half hour. <laughs> then this broadcast is over to make some sense of the things that I brabbled along here. I don't know, Tom, do you know... Do you even know the movie The Omen that I put the picture in here? Are you familiar uh, with that one? I've heard of it, Yerk, but no, I've never watched the movie. I uh, I can only imagine that it that it uh, parallels along with what I was taught in the churches by my Baptist uh, during my adult years and my charismatic uh, Pentecostal pastors and teachers uh, during my youth. Mm. And that is, and that is that the the Antichrist is a single individual that uh, is born and raised into the world, and eventually becomes the Antichrist by signing a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews, allowing them to build an ant, uh, a, a temple. They call it the Tribulation Temple, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to begin animal sacrifices again. When every Christian ought to know, God is not going to accept the blood of lambs and goats. Not after his son bled and died on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago. Not after his son, who bore a robe of flesh just like ours, was tempted in every way like as we are yet without sin and then offered himself a sacrifice on the, on the cross and bore our sin and our punishment on his body as a substitute in order that we might live. And they're going to take that 70th week of Daniel in which Jesus did all of that and they're going to have a redo, a do-over. Only this time it's going to be this Antichrist figure that's going to sign a peace treaty with the Jews to allow them to build a temple and make sacrifices again. And the whole world's going to believe God's behind it. Why? Why? Because we've been taught by all this by our lovely Protestant and evangelical pastors. Now, surely, they're the elect, and we ought to obey, obey and agree with everything they say, right? Just like the Roman Catholic priests demand that they not be questioned. Well, I'm telling you, the Scripture questions every futurist pastor in this world. There is no future fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. No one's going to open up the scroll break all the seals and open up that vision and that prophecy and redo it again with the Antichrist being the one who makes a covenant with many for one week. And if God allows this to actually happen, only those who have rejected Jesus Christ will believe it and accept it and go along with it and be deceived by it. So my job is to make sure that the elect are not deceived by this. And here's the, here's the key. If you are sitting here listening to this program 
and you think that there is or even might be even one element of Daniel's prophecy that was not perfectly and completely fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago as, as visibly proven in the New Testament, then you are going to be deceived. You are going to be deceived by a false antichrist and you're going to receive a false Christ. You're listening to the wrong authority. You've been deceived. All right, but don't feel bad. I was deceived for 50 years of my life. And it was only by the mercy and grace of Almighty God that I'm no longer deceived by futurism. You don't have to be deceived any longer by futurism. All you have to do is return to the historicist understanding of Daniel's prophecy. And that is written in black and white in the authorized 1611 King James Bible. You've got a copy of it, possibly a half a dozen copies of it that you can read at your leisure anytime. Just make sure you're not reading a, 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 uh, a counterfeit Bible. Make sure you're not reading a false word of God. The authorized King James Version is the, is the Bible for English-speaking people. And then once you realize that Jesus fulfilled it all, that that vision and that prophecy has been rolled up and sealed for eternity, it is finished. And no one can legitimately open that scroll but Jesus Christ himself. Then you've got to start praying for your Protestant and evangelical pastor because they're not Protestant and they're not evangelical. They're papist or Jesuit. They're serving the man of sin in Rome. And they're doing it from your pulpit in the middle of your church. Are you going to allow him to remain welcome in your house? We've got to take back our heritage our historicist heritage, our historicist understanding of Daniel's prophecy. Because to fail to do that is to accuse God of once sending his only begotten son into this world to bleed and die, to sign a blood covenant with God's people, to, to, to bear their sins upon his sinless body, to pay the price for our sins and reconciling us, reconcile us to God and to watch our Savior die on the cross for us, for our benefit, for our everlasting life, and then to turn around and leave those people who were redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb wide open to be deceived by the man of sin is to accuse God of an atrocity. God did not play so fast and loose with, the, with his sons and daughters to leave them in doubt about who this Antichrist is. Only your pastor has deceived you. God didn't. God left you written record of who your Messiah is and how he perfectly and completely fulfilled Daniel's prophecy. And how he sits now at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. And that power that replaced the Caesars, who were restraining his rise to power, once they were taken out of the way, the Pope ruled in his place. Now he's called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, vicarious filii day. And he rules over the kings of the earth, and he persecutes God's people, and he has for centuries and centuries and millennia. Do you realize nearly two millennia this man has abused God's people? 
And what people and what part of God's people did he abuse? Those who were fearless to stand before the world and tell the world the truth. Jesus is the Christ. The papacy is the Antichrist. And we've got the blood of the martyrs of Jesus to prove it. Just as we have the blood of Jesus to redeem us from our sins, we have the evidence of the blood of the martyrs of Jesus all throughout history to testify in every generation of the church age that the papacy is the, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, the little horn, the antichrist. And who would be so foolish as to suggest that he's not the man of sin? That is your that is your priester and your pastor behind the pulpit of your churches. And now you should have by now a very good idea what you should do with him. <laughs> Sing song to sing together.